Okay, so <clears throat> here we go with SIA GCSE Unit 1 in Physics from 2022, and this is the higher paper. Okay, let's get started. Question 1. Two friends, A and B, have a race over a distance of 80 metres. On the grid below are their distance time graphs. And you can see we've got two distance time graphs. One here for A, which is this dotted line. One here for B, which is this solid line. And we can tell that um, the solid line here, which is B, they actually started at time zero, whereas the dotted line A started at time equal to 10 seconds. So it's, it's as if they've given them a head start of 10 seconds. And we have a couple of questions here. It says, is that how far in front is B uh, when A begins to run? And uh, so that's this 10 second event here. So we want to look at the distance between the two runners when this one starts to run how far is it between these two runners and we can see on this axis here that it's 20 meters so I've indicated that to myself on my graph but I need to now put it in the answer spot part two then uh, for how many seconds has B been running when he is overtaken by A uh, overtaking will occur when both runners have reached the same distance on the track and so we're looking for the point where their lines cross over and you can see that that happens over here when they have both run 40 meters then uh, previously the dotted line was always lower than the, the solid line but after this, the dotted line is ahead. In other words, it has run more meters, which means that person's ahead. So the point of them crossing is when they have both run 40 meters. After that, the dotted line is ahead. And before that, the dotted line is behind. So uh, we want to know for how many seconds has B been running by the time A overtakes them. OK, so that's how long it takes in seconds to reach this point. And you can see that that is 20 seconds. So I've indicated that to myself on the graph, but I need to also put it in the answer spot. Part three, calculate the speed of A during the race and show clearly how you get your answer, starting with the equation you plan to use. So I'm going to bring forward a copy of the graph here. So firstly, we remind ourselves that they're particularly interested in the speed of A. Sorry, I'll just change that. Highlighter was annoyingly set to black there. Um, so yeah, it's the speed of A. So we're interested in the dotted line graph specifically. And since this is a distance time graph, we can get the speed from the gradient so we can do rise over run or we can do uh, the distance traveled divided by the time taken which is the same thing really so the distance is the rise and you can see that a starts here at 10 and finishes the run at 30 so that is the run of this triangle and that is their uh, time taken it took them th uh, from 10 to 30 so from 10 to 30 is 20 seconds so speed's going to be the gradient belonging to a or you could do distance over time as long as you pick the right distance and the right time from the graph 
how long A was running is 20 seconds. Lots of people are tempted to write in 30 because it ends at 30, but it didn't start until 10. So be very careful about that. Uh, whereas when you're finding a gradient, you, you can much more clearly see what you're doing. You've got a triangle which has a height and a width. So the rise for both of them is 80 metres, but the run for A is only 20 seconds. And that means we're going to get 4 metres per second. And you can see where the marks are coming from here. There's four marks. Stating what you're doing, that's your first mark. Substituting in your correct two values, that's your second mark. And your third mark, probably. And then the answer becomes your fourth mark. And so you could also use speed as distance over time. But you're still filling in the distance here from the 80 metres. And you might want to show that time is 30 minus 10. But you will still get the same answer, obviously. So remember, if you do use distance over time, that you don't just read numbers from the end of the line. You know, the end of the B line happens at 80 meters and 30 seconds but because they didn't start at zero then those numbers aren't the straight way of calculating in if you are sorry the a line uh, if you were looking at b they did start at time equal to zero so their final two numbers of 80 and 40 are actually their total distance and their total time um, but because uh, a started later then their 10 seconds at the beginning isn't part of them running. It's only the 20 seconds that happen after that that's them running. So be very careful about graphs that don't start from zero because some people are used to just reading the last value and the last value and so they would read 80 and 30 and get the wrong answer. Just be careful about that. Especially if you're working along with me and you've just noticed that you've done that. Leave yourself a wee note to uh, to keep that in mind okay part b then as a marble rolls from rest down a slope it accelerates and the velocity time graph for the marble is shown below you can see here we've got an increasing velocity then a steady velocity so that might be you know where there was a slope down and then a flat bit and so the slope down it was always accelerating and then the flat bit it had just its final steady velocity. And so this is the kind of um, behavior you might get where there was a slope followed by a flat bit. Um, so you can, the slope will continue to make you accelerate, but the flat bit, you'll just have a steady velocity then. Okay, so what are they asking? Okay, so calculate the total displacement of the marble in the four seconds of its motion show clearly how you get your answer. So I'll bring the graph back down. And you can see we've obviously got two phases, but if you remember your rules about your displacement and how it relates to a velocity time graph, the displacement is the area under the velocity time graph. So we need to break this into two areas, basically a little triangle that runs here and then a little rectangle that runs here and those are the two areas that you want to get. There is no single equation that will solve this. There is no point going for an equation because remember the uh, equations of motion, the UVAST equations can deal with uh, constant acceleration like this uh, and ordinary distance speed time can deal with a steady speed situation but there isn't an equation that deals with all of this so if you try and sort of just put um, an equation in where it goes from 0 to 4 uh, you don't have a constant acceleration so there's no UVAST that will fix this the UVAST can only deal with a straight line on a velocity time graph it can't deal with two different gradients here because it deals with what we call uniform acceleration which is only one gradient so yeah you would have to do this by an, 
by an equation, you would have to do UVAST for this bit. And then you would have just ordinary speed equals uh, distance over time. So distance equals speed times time for this bit. But as far as we're concerned, if we find the two areas, that's the quickest method by a long, long way. So as I say, we've got these two zones that we're trying to find the area of, a triangle and a rectangle, and we just call them A and B. So you would divide it up. You wouldn't necessarily shade it in, but you would divide it up into a triangle and a rectangle to let the examiner see what you're doing. So we just state that our total displacement is going to be the area under the graph, and that means we need area A added to area B. And then we need to reach into the distant past of our maths knowledge and get the area of a triangle. Um, obviously the area of B, the rectangle, is a lot easier. It's just length times width. But the area of a triangle, you remember, is a half times the base times the height. And so we have those numbers. So a half times the base, which is it's three wide here. You can see that it's three wide and it's they're both nine tall. Okay, so a half times three times nine is our triangle. And then B is just going to be, it's, it's like one second wide and it's nine centimeters per second tall. So it's just one times nine. So we've got a half times three times nine. So a half of three is like one and a half. So one and a half nines is like nine plus four and a half which is going to be like 13.5 and we're adding to that one times nine which is just nine okay so 13 and a half plus nine gives us 22.5 centimeters and we are in centimeters because if you multiply seconds by centimeters per second you're going to get sec centimeters So the important part of this is remembering how the total displacement can be found from a velocity time graph. You know, somebody, for example, could look, show you a velocity time graph and ask you for the average velocity. Now you can't really get that from this because it's got like two different behaviors. You know, if you've only got a, if the only thing happening is acceleration then the average velocity is going to be the halfway mark here. Um, but the average velocity, since it continues on at a different steady speed, isn't going to be uh, gettable just by averaging some velocities. Uh, but you can always get total displacement. And so there is an option to get the average velocity here by dividing the total displacement, which we've just found, by the total time. And so just be aware of that in questions where they ask you for an average velocity from a graph that has, um, you know, two different accelerations. This one has an acceleration here and then it has an acceleration of nothing for the second part. So there's no simple way and you can't use a half of u plus v um, to get your average velocity because uh, averaging those will only give you the average velocity for part A. Just be aware of that if you see a question of that type. Part two then, calculate the acceleration of the marble as it rolls down the slope in the first three seconds. So they're very specific that they want you to look at the first three seconds. Because obviously the, the bit after that has a different acceleration of nothing. So be very careful. And there's lots of people, I've seen this question done before and people have missed this. So they're only interested in the first three seconds. So again, I've brought the graph forward just for us to look at. So they're talking about the acceleration, which is constant during phase A, which is the first three seconds. So that's easy. We have an expression for that um, uh, when we have a constant acceleration, that A is V minus U over T. But that is also the gradient of this graph. So you can do this by that method or by this method. So the gradient of a velocity time graph is the acceleration. 
in the same way that the gradient of a distance time graph is speed. Okay, so the velocity time graph, when you take the gradient, you get the rate at which the velocity is changing. Um, and that's what we call acceleration. So the acceleration is the gradient of a velocity time graph. And you should always state this up front to the examiner. And so it's going to be the rise over the run for section A. And so we've got a rise here of 9 centimetres per second and a run of 3 seconds. So we just sub those in. And you can see by looking at this, sorry, that uh, V minus U, the final velocity of, of uh, 9 minus U at naught, that, you know, that that also is going to equal the rise. So when you write A equals V minus U over T, you're really finding the same thing. So V minus U over T is an acceptable alternative to doing this. Because we do have just the one acceleration in phase A. So it is okay to use UVAST equations. Okay, so let's fill in that rise of 9 and that run of 3. And 9 over 3 is going to give us 3 centimetres per second squared. But V minus U over T would have also given us that, you know, 9 minus naught on the top line and 3 on the bottom would still be 9 over 3. But remember, you can only use UVAST equations where there is a single straight line on the velocity time graph. You cannot have more than one acceleration in a set of equations that require acceleration to be constant. Part C then, uh, one of part C is explain the difference between a vector and a scalar. And so we know that vectors and scalars that uh, nature comes into, uh, sort of breaks into two categories of numbers. Numbers that have just a unit associated with them and a magnitude and other things that seem to have a directional property and we call the things with a directional property vectors. So remember when you're asked about the difference between two things, difference between a this and a that, you must talk about what this has and the fact that that does not contain it. This and that have to both be spoken about when you're asked to compare. So we're now asked for a uh, example of a vector, example of a scalar. So just pick two really simple ones, like um, for a vector, something like displacement. And the corresponding one for a scalar would be something like distance or speed for scalar and velocity for a vector. It doesn't really matter though. You don't have to have corresponding ones. You can have completely different ones. But this is why you should learn off your vectors and your scalars from your notes. You will have been given a set of examples of vectors, a set of examples of scalars, and you should be learning those. Part two then, the world record for a Formula One racing car to complete one lap of the Silverstone racing track is 90.6 seconds. The distance around the track is 5.89 kilometers. Uh, explain why the cars the car's average velocity was nothing. Okay, and this is about the fact that velocity uh, has, uh, you know, a component in it that comes from dividing a displacement by a time. Uh, so when you arrive back after having completed a lap of the track, you will have arrived back at the same point you started from. So if this is your start point and the track sort of has a shape which results in you arriving back at that point, then your net displacement is nothing. So if we find velocity by dividing total displacement by total time, what we'll find is that at the end of that lap, our displacement, since we're about to move off from the point we started from, our displacement from that position is nothing. And therefore, we're dividing a displacement of nothing by a time. So after one lap, your displacement will equal zero because you're back where you started. 
So V also equals zero. And again, note how that's different from calculating speed, which is total distance over total time. And total distance, ignoring direction, actually is just the length of this green line in kilometers, which they've given us there as 5.89. This green line is 5.89 kilometers long. And so the distance has a value. But when you arrive back here, your displacement from your start point is nothing. So I hope that clarifies that for you. Part D, a ball bounces and then begins to rise vertically from the ground with a velocity of six meters per second. Calculate the time for the ball to reach its maximum height. So if you remember what happens when something bounces, if we put like a bit of ground here and we think about a ball that's bouncing, and we're told it comes up at six meters per second. So what will happen? So we can imagine the ball bouncing. Wait, give me a second. Try that again. Rising, reaches its highest point, falls again. So we're talking about um, the fact that it starts at six, it's decelerating the whole way up. It slows down, it reaches this highest point. And when it reaches its highest point, its velocity in the upper direction will be zero. And so we've got essentially a u of six meters per second and a v of zero. And during that time, it will have reached a maximum displacement of s in the upper direction. And that's going to be its maximum height. So we've got an s that we don't know. And we don't know the time it takes for that either. But we do know that the acceleration is downward. And it's a value of g, the acceleration due to gravity. And we know that that's 10 meters per second squared. And we know that it points down. And that means if we give that 6 meters per second a positive value, if we take up to be positive, and that's what I'm going to do here, I'm going to make a decision that up is plus here okay and that means that when I write my uvas list out I will write out u is plus six but when I write out a I'm going to be writing it in as negative ten so u is plus six v is nothing a is going to be negative ten and in OG isn't exactly ten but in questions where we haven't been told otherwise we always take g to be ten meters per second squared S and T are both unknowns, but T in particular is the one they're asking us to find. So that means that T is important and S can be ignored. So we want an equation because we need to find T that has T in it and these other numbers that we know. But we don't need S. We don't need an equation with S in it because that would give us two unknowns. So we need an equation that includes T and ignores S. So if you think about your equations of motion then, it should be easy to pick out that that is going to be V equals U plus AT. And a good idea before you start subbing numbers in is to rearrange it for T equals. So we need to subtract U from both sides and then we need to divide both sides by A. So subtracting u, we get v minus u equals a t, and then divide by a, we get v minus u over a equals t. So now we need to just sub the actual values from our uvas list in. So v minus u is naught minus 6, and we're dividing by minus 10. And so minus 6 over minus 10 gives us 0 0.6 of a second. So uh, it says then using your answer to part one or otherwise calculate the maximum height reached by the ball. Um, and the or otherwise comes down to that UVAS list that we had before. Because before we were saying, right, well, we're going to score out S and just look for T. 
but we could have easily done that the other way around and scored out t and looked for s as being the important thing and that's what they mean or otherwise so it is possible to find s by looking at equations that ignore t and have all of these things in them okay and you realize there's an equation v squared equals u squared plus 2as which doesn't involve t and so it is possible to get it from that so uh, what they're hinting at is that a half of u plus v is sort of like the average of these two velocities and that's you're allowed to do that in a um, uvas problem where there's constant acceleration so this basically says that the displacement is going to be the average velocity times the time so that's the simplest mathematical way to do it but it involves the use of a number that we just found for t that may or may not be wrong so the cleaner way to do it mathematically is to use v squared equals u squared plus 2as and the reason is that it only has numbers in it that were in the original problem it doesn't have a t that we calculated and could be wrong so i'll do it by both ways okay so a half of u plus v times t we'll do that first so that becomes a half of 6 for u plus 0 for v times the 0.6 we got for t. Uh, so you can see that the, the bracket's going to just be 6. So a half of 6 is 3. And basically we're doing 3 times 0.6. And 3 times 0.6 gives us 1.8 meters. So let's do it now by the other method. Firstly, I would want to rearrange that. So I want to write it as uh, v squared minus u squared over 2a gives us s. And now we sub into that. So v squared is going to be naught squared, u squared is going to be 6 squared, and 2a is going to be 2 times minus 10. And the top line is going to end up minus 6 squared, which is minus 36, and the bottom line is going to be minus 20. And you can see that's also going to simplify to 1.8. So two different methods. However, the first method will give you a wrong answer if your t is wrong. So it very much depends on that 0.6 being the right answer. Whereas the second method doesn't depend on t and therefore is independently able to give you the right answer even if your first calculation has gone wrong okay I hope that explains why you might use the second method question two then during an experiment to investigate the stretching of a spring values of the force and extension were recorded and plotted on the grid below We've got force up the, the side there and uh, extension along the bottom in centimetres. And they're asking us to draw a line through the points and use it to estimate the force that corresponds to the limit of proportionality. Okay, so by looking at the graph, we can see that it is linear, it is proportional, and then it turns away from that proportionality so we have to sort of go straight with a ruler here and then it turns away and follows these other points so the first part should be ruled and then it becomes a curve and if I'm honest I would I would only really use the upper point in the straight part to be the end of it being proportional so we'll draw that in first of all so we've got a ruled straight bit followed by a curve. And I'll tell you now, it took me about eight goes before I got that curve looking anything like what I wanted it to. So top tip for graphs is to not be drawing these with a pen because a pen is a very unforgiving um, thing if you make a mistake. So be very aware of that. A pen will not forgive you. Uh, and so you should be drawing this with a pencil uh, so that you can make corrections. So you can see there that the limit of proportionality is when it stops being linear. And it stops being linear here.
And so we're asked to record the force at which that happens, okay? And so we can see that that occurs at a force here on this axis of eight newtons. And remember, capital N for newtons, let's not have Isaac turning over in his grave. All units that are named after a person are a capital letter. And so your two marks come from a straight bit with a curve. So you get a mark for drawing the correct line and then filling in this value. Eight and Newtons to get your second mark. So you probably have to have both these features to get the first mark, the line and the curve, and the value and the unit to get the second mark. Part two then, using the data shown in the graph, calculate the spring constant for the spring. State the unit of the spring constant with your answer. So you remember from Hooke's law that F equals KE. And so rearranging that K is going to be F over E. And if we just bring back our graph here to look at, we've got an F here up the side. So that's the Y. Uh, extension E along the bottom, that's the X. And so this graph corresponds to Y equals MX. So K here is the gradient. It's a rise over a run for that straight part. And so we have a force value of eight, a rise, if you want to call it that, and a run value corresponding of 16 centimeters. And that means that K is going to be 0 0.5. And we divide Newtons by centimetres, so it's going to be in Newtons per centimetre. Because we divided 8 Newtons by 16 centimetres. So we're dividing Newtons by centimetres. That's why the unit ends up like that. So 0 0.5 for the value and Newtons per centimetre for the unit. So it says now uh, on the graph, we want you to draw uh, the graph that would be obtained for a spring with a spring constant of half the value of the one shown and stop your graph at eight newtons, okay? So remember, this is how many newtons it costs per centimeter. So we need half a newton for each centimeter of extension. So if it's half that again, then it's going to be like 0.25 newtons per centimetre. So now lots of people can't visualise it that way. So for an awful lot of people, it's much easier to just use the equation and to change the value of k. Because they're telling us that they want us to look at it for the value of 8 newtons. So if we make that the value of f, we make the value of k half of this, we'll get the value of e that it's going to. So let's try that. You might find that easier to think about. So we're interested in finding an e when force is 8 and k is 0.25. So we start with our Hooke's Law equation that uh, f equals ke. Then we get e on its own by dividing both sides by k. And then we just substitute into that. Eight divided by 0 0.25 and divided by a quarter is like multiplying by four. So we get E of 32. So eight Newtons and 32 means at eight Newtons, we will be on this line. So we're actually gonna get a straight line to this point here where eight Newtons corresponds to 32 centimeters. So a line like that with a ruler all the way to 8 newtons and 32 centimetres. So you can see before we had, um, sorry, half a newton per centimetre. So we were needing to put in half a newton to get each centimetre. Having that, we needed to only put in a quarter of a newton to get each centimeter. So we get twice as many centimeters for the same amount of newtons.
So you can think of a smaller spring constant as a stretchier spring. It stretches more for the same amount of force. In this case, it'll stretch twice as much. So a halving of the spring constant makes the spring stretch twice as much. Part B then, the diagram shows a double-decker bus undergoing a tilt test. The centre of gravity is an important concept when dealing with the stability of an object such as a double-decker bus. Describe the role the centre of gravity and other factors play in the stability of a double-decker bus. In your answer, you should include the meaning of the centre of gravity, how the position of centre of gravity affects stability, Another factor affecting stability, why standing on the upper deck of a bus is not allowed, and what causes the bus to fall over if it is tilted beyond a certain angle. So these are all just straight out of your notes on uh, what the centre of gravity is and how you can create a stable situation. So firstly, we have this idea that the centre of gravity is the point on an object where we can consider that the weight of it acts so we can imagine that it's a point on this bus where we can mark the weight of the bus acting down from it. That's really effectively what the centre of gravity is. How does the position of a centre of gravity affect stability? Well, buses will be more stable if they have a lower centre of gravity. So we want the centre of gravity to be lower in the bus to make it more stable. Okay, So the lower the centre of gravity is, the more stable the bus will be. Uh, another factor affecting the centre of gravity, or, sorry, affecting stability, so we've got low centre of gravity, there's two facts you're supposed to learn. One of them is that a stable thing will have a low centre of gravity, and the other one is that it will have a wide base, so the width of the base here. Okay, don't talk about the area, it's literally how far it is from one corner at the bottom to the other corner at the bottom okay don't talk about the area because if you think about something like a table it has just two legs touching the ground and the two legs of the table don't necessarily have a big area so it really comes down to the width of the base how far they are apart that makes the table nice and stable okay so it's the width of the base and how low the centre of gravity is. So we've already talked about the centre of gravity needs to be low. When they talk about this second thing, you're talking about the width of the base. A wider base creates a more stable object as well. Why would standing on the upper deck of a bus not be allowed? Well, if people stand up, that raises the centre of gravity. You know, if the centre of gravity of objects, including people, in the top. So let's say we start off with the centre of gravity here, somebody up here standing up. So if they're higher than they were, that will make the centre of gravity move up. That's the thing that's going to happen. If everybody in the top deck stands up, then the centre of gravity will start to rise because they are part of the bus. Once you're on the bus, you're part of the centre of gravity of the bus. So if everyone stands up on the top deck, that will raise the centre of gravity. If they all are standing up instead of sitting down like good boys and girls, that will cause the centre of gravity to start to rise. And remember, a low centre of gravity is more stable, so a raising of a centre of gravity will make the bus more unstable. What causes the bus to fall over if it is tilted beyond a certain point? Well, that comes to... The relationship between the bus and the corner it's tilting over onto. So this corner effectively becomes the pivot. And the weight of the bus is currently creating a clockwise moment. So you can imagine what you've got is a pivot and the weight is still acting on this side of it. And that creates a clockwise moment. When will that stop happening? Well, when you tilt the bus f far enough that that is not true anymore. I just unlock the 
um, rotation of this page here for a second to try and show you. What will happen is that as the bus rotates, the center of gravity will eventually be right over the pivot and it will pass it and create a, a moment on the other side then. So if you tilt the bus beyond a certain point, the center of gravity will go outside the base and when it goes outside the base, then it will tip over. So as long as the center of gravity is pointing down inside the base, then it'll, it'll stay up. But if the center of gravity starts to be beyond the base and the weight points outside the base, then the bus will tip over. So go back through those things a few times. Um, I'm not going to type them all out, but if you go back through what I've said there and make some notes. So the centre of gravity is the point on an object where we can consider its weight to act. Uh, centre of gravity and stability is the idea that stable objects have low centres of gravity, so the lower the centre of gravity the better. Another factor affecting the, center, the stability of an object is the width of the base. So objects with a wider base will be more stable. Standing on the upper deck raises the centre of gravity. And so we need it to be low. If you raise it, then the stability is reduced. And then the tipping over is when the bus centre of gravity passes the bottom edge of the base. Once the bus has been tipped, so the centre of gravity is acting outside the base, that's when it'll tip over. If it's acting down through that green base, then it will continue to create a clockwise moment and straighten the bus up every time the, it's let go of. So if you pull the bus to this position, um, it'll go beyond the green bit and it will now have a anti-clockwise moment and it'll fall to the ground. But if you haven't tilted it enough and the, the weight is still acting through the green bit, then it will have a clockwise moment and it will tip this way. So if I can get this force on to the right here of this green bit, it will fall that way. Once it goes to the left, we've tipped it too far, it will fall down. So a nice way of saying that is that so long as the weight is acting through the base or the centre of gravity is still over the base, then the bus will stay upright. Part C then, the, the forces acting on a car of mass 2,000 kilograms are shown in the diagram below. So we have a force driving the car forward, so this is some pull from the engine. And then we've got resistive force holding the car back. That will be things like um, the resistance of the mechanical parts and the uh, air resistance that's acting. The acceleration of the car is 0.4 meters per second squared. Calculate the size of the resistive force. Okay, so this is, is we've got an acceleration, so we're not dealing with Newton's first law. Remember, Newton's first law says that if the forces are balanced, the car will have a steady speed. This car doesn't have a steady speed. The second law deals with the idea that if there's an unbalanced force, then the object will accelerate according to the rule F equals ma. Now, it's important for us to realize that this is a vector equation. F is a vector and A is a vector and A gets its direction from F. So if we know the direction of F, we know the direction of A. But the important thing is that F is a resultant here and it's in the direction of A because they always have the same direction. The F in this equation always has the same direction as the A. So it's a good way to think about the, uh, Newton's second law is to think about it as the resultant force in the direction of A equals MA. So resultant force in the direction of A equals MA means that there's a certain way round that we should deal with these forces. Now if I call the resistive force R, 
and the force from the engine, like E, then the resultant in the direction of A, since we know that A points over this way, is going to be E minus R, because E is in the direction of A, so E is going to be the positive thing, R is going to be the negative thing, so we can write it as E minus R equals MA. So to get R on its own, we would need to like add R to both sides and subtract MA, because we don't want to leave a minus R, so we'll add R to both sides and subtract MA from both sides. Sorry, my mic went off there, so um, I'm just I'm not sure how much of that you heard. So we're going to um, add R to both sides and subtract MA to both sides, so we get a positive R on its own. So we now do minus MA both sides, and we'll get R equals E minus MA. And now we just sub to get R. E is 1200, M is 2000, A is 0.4. And 2,000 times 0.4 is going to be like 800. So we're subtracting 800 from 1,200, which means that R equals 400 newtons. So there's a resistive force of 400 newtons acting. So it's important to think of F equals MA in this idea that these are two vectors, the resultant force has to be pointing in the direction of A because the, the force equation for F equals MA, um, M is a scalar, so F can only get its direction from A, so F and A must always have the same direction as each other. And so when we write it like this, it becomes more obvious which way around we need to put these two. You know, E points in the direction of A, so we put it first and subtract R, because it points in the opposite. Or you could think of it as E being a plus number and R being a negative number. But when one of these is an unknown, it's very difficult to um, deal with that. So we tend to think of E pulling this way, R pulling that way. So it's E minus the effect of R. Hopefully that makes sense. And that works in any kind of F equals MA, you know, even in higher up when you're in A level and it's like a circular motion force or something. So it works always in any circumstance as long as you think about the direction that A is going and try to write the resultant force in that direction. Okay, what have we got now? A uniform meter rule is pivoted at the 30 centimeter mark. It is balanced by a 4 newton force acting at the 20 centimeter mark. Okay, so this is one of these things where you're calculating the weight of the meter stick. Okay, so it's a standard sort of experiment. And it uses all the rules of center of gravity. So firstly, we are told that it's a uniform meter rule. Now what that means is that the, the mass of the wood of the meter stick or the plastic of the meter stick is uniformly distributed. There's equal amounts all the way through. That means that the centre of gravity of this will be in the middle. So uniform things, that's what it's telling us about the object. Essentially, it's telling us that the centre of gravity is at the middle. And we know the middle of a meter stick is at the 50 centimetre mark. Now we have another fact about the centre of gravity, and we've talked about it in the previous question. The centre of gravity is the point on an object where we can imagine its weight acts. So we can write the weight acting from the 50 centimetre mark, because that's where the centre of gravity is. And so this is a simple moments problem. We've got W here acting a certain distance from the pivot, and we've got the 4 acting a certain distance from the pivot. Now, I always advise when you're doing this kind of a problem, an immediate redraw with just a simple beam and only the forces and the distances that you're interested in on the diagram. Okay, so we've got a 4 and we've got a W and the 4 is clearly closer. The 4, as you can see, is 10 centimetres from the pivot and the W 
is 20 centimeters from the pivot and that's what we want to add to our diagram and you can see now that we've got a ridiculously easy um, moments problem here now I always mark the pivot on and you'll see why in a second because now I can write my uh, principle of moments equation clockwise moment about a pivot equals the anti-clockwise moment about a pivot and in symbols that looks like this or actually I'm going to write the anti-clockwise because that's on the left hand side so the anti-clockwise moment about P equals the clockwise moment about P this is how you would write it in symbols or you can write that out as a big long sentence the anti-clockwise moment about the pivot equals the clockwise moment about the pivot so mathematicians are lazy so we have a symbol for that you must identify P and then you can just write these versions of it okay so we want to write the anti-clockwise moment about P and that corresponds to the thing trying to pull it this way which is this 4 newtons so moment is force times distance 4 times 10 and that's equal to the thing trying to pull it that way and the thing trying to turn it clockwise is W times 20 and you can see we've got an equation with one unknown we need to divide both sides by 20 to get W on its own okay and 4 tens are 40 over 20 means W equals 2 and that's going to be an answer in Newtons so the important parts of this really come down to our knowledge of what this statement means how that leads to positioning of the centre of gravity and our knowledge of the centre of gravity meaning that that's where we can mark the weight of the object those are the important parts once you've got that this becomes a very simple balanced moments problem but if you don't know where this W needs to go you don't spot this sentence you don't remember this fact that the center of gravity of a uniform object will be in the middle then it becomes a mystery so center of gravity of a uniform things in the middle the middle of a hundred meter hundred centimeter meter stick is the 50 mark that means we can mark W there which means we can draw this little diagram once we have this diagram we have a very simple solution so it all comes in the memory of the various important facts which is why you should really learn your little facts because they will come to your rescue okay part E then diagram shows one tire of a car in contact with the road the downward force on the road is 5,000 newtons and the pressure that tire exerts on the road is 2.5 times 10 to the 5 pascals calculate the area of the tire in contact with the road okay so if you've ever like pushed your face up against a piece of glass or whatever uh, or someone else has done it you'll see the sort of the bit where their face goes flat is the actual area of contact so when a tire touches the road a certain amount of the tire actually creates an area of contact so there'll be a little flattened bit just like your face against a window there'll be a little flattened bit here that makes the area of contact and that's what they're asking us to find this area of tire contact with the road and it comes from these numbers they have given us a value for P and a value for F and they're asking us for a value of A so do we have an equation with P and F and A in it well we do if you remember your equations and again as well as your basic facts you absolutely need to know your equations pressure is force over area which means that area is going to be force over pressure so we'll just copy our values down to here so we've got a pressure of 2.5 times 10 to the 5 pascals which you remember is the same as newtons per meter squared we've got a force of 5,000 newtons and we'll just go back over our rearrangement of our formula so for those of you who like uh, formula triangles you know P equals F over A can be written as P F A F has to be over A remember because it was over A in our equation it has to be over A in the formula triangle and then to get A on its own we just cover it so A is going to be F over P 
Um, so if you don't like doing algebra, you can rearrange it by that. But you must make sure that the one that you've learnt is exactly when you cover P, it does equal F over A. Otherwise, you haven't drawn this correctly and it's no use to you. So P has to be equal to F over A so that we can say that A is F over P. And so we just substitute into that then. Um, we've got a force value of 5,000 and a pressure value of 2.5 times 10 to the 5. Okay. And make sure you're typing the 2.5 times 10 to the 5 in using your proper standard form EXP or 10 to the times 10 to the uh, whatever button. Don't be writing it in as 2.5 times 10 to the power of 5 or you'll have a bid mass error where you'll end up with a completely wrong answer. So make sure you know how to use your calculator to type in a standard form number. So I'm getting 0 0.02 and that'll be an answer in meters squared. Part three, uh, or question three, sorry, in part A. An experiment is carried out by a student to find the density of a metal. The metal object to be used has an irregular shape. Briefly describe how the student would accurately measure the volume in the measuring cylinder. Okay, so we've got this object being lowered from a piece of string or thread or whatever into a measuring cylinder. And the idea here is that we um, take like a before reading and an after reading before we've lowered it in and that will give us a change of volume and the change of volume comes from the object that we put in so if you imagine this was lower this level was lower but when we put this in it, it comes up a little bit and it comes up by the amount of the extra volume we have added in and so you get basically a before and after reading Actually, I'm getting ahead of myself here. I was wondering why it was only worth one mark. But uh, the reason is that they only want us at this stage to talk about how we would accurately measure the volume of water in this cylinder. OK, and you can see they've drawn a little curve here. And that's what they're getting at, that we always measure to the bottom of the meniscus. Okay, so um, you get your eye level with it. You put it on a level surface, you get your eye level and read to the bottom of the meniscus. And the meniscus is that wee curve that the water makes. So, the metal object is placed in a measuring cylinder which initially contained, that's your before reading, 220 centimetres cubed. Uh, the metal object has a volume of 28 centimetres cubed. What would the reading on the cylinder be after the metal object is added? So you basically have to add the volume of the object to the initial volume that was in the cylinder and you get 248 centimetres cubed. Part three, the density of the metal is found to be 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed. Using the information in part two, calculate the mass of the metal object. So this is about your ability to recognize the important numbers. So we're interested in the volume of the object and we were told that that was 28 centimeters cubed. Now, uh, some books use rho, the Greek rho, for density. I'll just use d uh, just to make it clearer. So the density is this value of 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed. And we know that density is mass over volume. So mass is going to be density times volume. And that's going to be 2.7 times 28. And that works out to be 75.6, and that'll be in grams. So the important thing here is extracting the correct information.
So we've got the density of the material, we've got the volume of the object itself, and we can only get the mass of the object if we're using the density and the object itself's volume. So be careful. And obviously we're not going to get anywhere if we don't know our density formula, so make sure you're practicing your formulae. Okay, part four then the graph shows how the volume of a metal of density 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed varies with mass. Label each axis with the quantity and the unit. Okay, so we're asking, uh, we're, we're showing how the volume varies with mass. So when you're told a graph, uh, how it's plotted like this, the first thing mentioned is what's up the y-axis and the second thing mentioned is what's along the x-axis. So this is a volume up the side and mass along the bottom. Oh actually no. Uh, normally that would be what they mean but we have to pick it out so they've they've set it back to front and we have to notice. Uh, Okay, so what you do is you look at a value of 1. Here we've got a 1. And can you see that it goes to about 2.7? So this must be our 1 centimeter cubed. And this must be our 2.7 grams. Oh no, that is okay. So volume is up the side and mass is along the bottom. Right, that's fair enough then. Okay, so we just need to watch our units then. Okay. Um, so we've got V up the side, so that's the volume, and then we put the unit on it. Okay, so we've got volume, and that's in centimetres cubed. And then along the bottom we've got mass, and that's going to be in grams. And it's important that you use a slash to indicate that, that this is the name of the thing. This is the name of the thing being plotted. This is the unit it's being plotted in. This is the name of the thing being plotted. Slash, this is the unit it's being plotted in. Make sure you do that properly. And there's two marks for that. So you probably have to have uh, the label and its unit and then the label and its unit. The metal has a density of 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed and water has a density of 1.0 gram per centimeter cubed. Use the kinetic theory of matter to explain why water has a lower density than metal. So how does kinetic theory relate to density? Well, the idea that we have uh, particles and how densely packed they are really is how we get density. So it's all to do with how far apart particles are in the material and how much of the space is, is gaps between the particles. So yeah, water particles must be further apart. So if they spread out further, that creates a bigger volume for the same mass and that will create a lower density. Or you could set the other way around. The metal particles must be closer together to create a bigger density. So part two then wants us to identify which of the three states of matter these descriptions correspond to. The kinetic theory describes matter as a large number of particles. Um, the following statements are about the particles that are found in solids, liquids and gases. In each box state whether the statement relates to the particles in a solid, a liquid or a gas. So this is like straight from your notes, the descriptions of what's going on with the particle arrangements in solid liquid gas. Okay, so the particles have large gaps between them and are, are entirely free to move. The particles are mainly touching but have small gaps between them. The particles have strong forces between them. Okay, so strong forces between them basically means that the object will not change its shape easily. Um, and so that must be solid. Completely free. 
uh, to move must be gas. And then mainly touching with small gaps would allow them to move past each other, which is what we notice in a liquid. So with this kind of question, you want to sort of decide which one are you certain about and fill it in first and then decide of a this or that about the other two. So I could have easily looked at free to move there and immediately identified this as a gas and then looked at these two and compared them to see which one was a solid, which one was a liquid. Question 4a, part 1. The table below lists a number of energy resources. Tick with a tick. They show you what a tick is in case you don't know what a tick is. Uh, the appropriate box to classify them as either renewable or non-renewable. Okay, so we know that coal is something that we dig up. It's made from fossilized dinosaurs and, you know, uh, sorry, plant life. Uh, stuff from millions of years ago. We will eventually dig it all up and it will be gone, which makes it definitely non-renewable. Nuclear fission comes from uranium, and uranium is a material that we dig out of the ground, and it will eventually all be gone, and so it's non-renewable. Sunlight. You look out the window, if it's daytime, there will be sunlight. Tomorrow, there will be sunlight. The next day, there will be sunlight. It will happen every day. That's what we have, daytime. And that means there will be new sunlight every day. And so it's renewable. Geothermal uh, is to do with hot rocks in the earth. And there will be hot rocks in the earth tomorrow. And there'll be hot rocks in the earth tomorrow, the day after that. We're not digging them up. It's just heat that's in the earth. It will last for a very, very long time. Uh, and therefore we can class it as renewable. In what way does coal pollute the atmosphere? Explain your answer. So we know that coal, um, that the burning of fossil fuels produces carbon dioxide. So, you know, that's your basic answer. Coal also produces sulfur dioxide. And remember, if you're not going to write the whole words that the um, the two belonging to the O is not a squared. Lots of people write it as a squared up here. It's a subscript. It belongs down here. But I suppose you can just write the proper words if you're worried about not getting the marks. Part B then, the energy flow diagram for a food mixer is shown below. And you can see we've got 150 joules of uh, electricity going in, that turns to 20 joules of sound, 80 joules of kinetic, 50 joules of heat. Using the data in the diagram, calculate the efficiency of the food mixer. Okay, so we need to know our efficiency equation for this, and we need to identify the useful and uh, the non-useful, the waste energies. Okay, so I'm gonna just use my highlighter, and we'll talk about the useful. Well, what's a mixer meant to do? It's meant to spin that little whisk, okay? So it's the kinetic that's the useful. That's the useful right there. These are waste energies. So it's not designed to make a noise and it's not designed to warm things up. Okay. Um, so the useful energy is the kinetic. And so our equation for efficiency is the efficiency is the useful output energy over the total input energy. So it's vitally important we do a question like this so you get your bearings and figure out what everything is before you just start and ram stamming in uh, to equations with numbers without having thought about what are the relevant numbers here right well let's have a go then okay so we've got some space here to do this Okay, so useful output over total input, and now we sub into that. The useful output on the top line is the 80, and the total input is the 150. And remember, the top line should never be bigger than the bottom line. You, some people get this back to front, um, because, you know, you can't get more energy out of something than goes into it. The total energy coming out here is the sum of all of these three things, and that should come to the same 150 that went in. We're interested, though, in how much of it becomes useful form. And the useful form of the whisk is the motion that creates. 
So it'll always be a number smaller than this because the other stuff will have been wasted. So the output of a device can never be more than the input. So if you find that the top line here in an efficiency calculation is ever bigger than the bottom line, you've probably got it upside down. You should check what you've done. Okay, so 80 over 150 comes to like uh, 0.53 and then the threes are repeating. So 0.53, two significant figures will do here because one of our input numbers was only to two significant figures. Part C, a car of mass 500 kilograms is traveling at a velocity of 20 meters per second. Calculate the kinetic energy of the car. Show clearly how you get your answer starting with the equation you plan to use. Formula, numbers, answer. The unit is given here, so that's what the three marks are going to be for. So kinetic energy equation, we need to remind ourselves of that. It's a half times m times v squared. Again, you should know your equations long before you turn up to an exam or get close to one. And now we sub into that. We've got a half times the mass, which is 500, times 20 squared. And it's the 20 that's getting squared, not the whole thing, just the velocity. And I get 100,000, and that's going to be in joules. Formula, numbers, answer, unit. Well, not unit, because they gave the unit. Right then, so the driver applies the brakes and brings the car to a stop in 50 metres. How much work is done by the brakes in stopping the car? Well, the brakes, the work of the brakes is basically the loss of the kinetic energy. So the work is going to be the same as the value we've just found. So the kinetic energy turns to the work of the brake or it's 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 removed by the work of the brakes. So the work done in stopping the car is going to be the same as the kinetic energy it had. So you just copy your 100,000 joules. That's why there's only one mark. The car has a brake and each of its four wheels calculate the average force provided by each brake in stopping the car. Show clearly how you get your answer starting with the equation you plan to use. Okay, so this is basically work done equals the loss of kinetic energy. And work done is F times D, and the loss of kinetic energy is 100,000 joules. Now we were given D in the question. It says it's 50 meters. So the force acts over a distance of 50 meters, and that gives us then our distance. So F is going to be 100,000 over D, and that's going to be 100,000 over 50. And I get 2,000 newtons for that. And that's big F. But you can imagine that big F consists of four little Fs. And that's what they want. They want the force at each break. Then little F is going to be 2,000 over 4. And so the final value is going to be 500 newtons. So you can see there's not a lot of space there. And it could be easy to just put your 2000 in and forget to divide by four just watch that kind of thing what two forms of energy is the kinetic energy of the car changed into while braking okay so uh braking is a friction behavior you know you've got brake pads pushing against a surface and you know if you rub your hands together you'll notice them getting warm and you'll notice it makes a sound. And those are the two forms of energy. Friction converts kinetic energy into heat and sound. Part D then, the International Space Station orbits the Earth at a distance of 400 kilometers. And you can see it there, looks like a spool of thread or something, very high tech. Uh, the International Space Station has a mass of 4.2 times 10 to the five kilograms. Uh, show that the gravitational potential energy of the ISS is 1.68 times 10 to the 12 joules. 
Assuming the acceleration of free fall is the same at a height of 400 kilometers as it is on the surface of the earth. Show clearly how you get your answer. Okay, so we need to look at what's going on here with regard to energy. So gravitational potential energy equation, GPE equals mass times gravity times the height above the ground, MGH. So we've got a mass there. We're told we're allowed to keep G the same as it is at the, at the ground, which it technically wouldn't be. As you get further and further away from the planet, it'll decrease, obviously. Um, but we're allowed to use the G f that you would use at the ground, so we can use 10. Um, and then we multiply by the height that they've given us. But it needs to be in standard units so that this mass they've given us is in kilograms. That's fair enough. G, we're going to use 10 newtons per kilogram. That's going to be a standard unit. However, the kilometre here for this height is not a standard unit. So we need to recognise that as 400,000 metres. So 4.2 times 10 to the 5 kilograms times 10 for G times 400,000 metres. And that should give us our gravitational potential. And there's our value, 1.68 1 times 10 to the 12. And obviously I should have done that down here in the space that was provided for me but just to show you the numbers beside the diagram I thought it was better to draw it up there okay you should draw it down here it's just the limitation of space that I have on the iPad here okay what about this next part then the International Space Station is regularly supplied by rockets when a rocket or supply rocket sorry reaches the space station it has a potential energy of 0.3 times 10 to the 11 joules and a kinetic energy of 2 times 10 to the 11 joules. The rocket takes 600 seconds to reach the space station. Calculate the average power developed by the engines of the supply rocket. Show clearly how you get your answer stating the uh, starting with the equation you plan to use. So the first thing to recognize is that the rockets are entirely responsible for the total energy of the um the you know the rocket motors are entirely responsible for the total energy of the rocket so that would include its gravitational potential and its kinetic so we want to work out this total energy and then to get the power we want to divide that by the total time so it's going to be the sum of those energies over the time taken again we can't do this unless we know our power equation So we add our gravitational potential and our kinetic, that gives us our total energy, and we divide by the 600 seconds, which is how long it took for that energy to be given to the object. And that's going to give us this power. Now we're only really working to two significant figures here, so 3.8 times 10 to the 8 would cover this. You can see that there are uh, eight digits between the three and the decimal point there. So it's 3.8 times 10 to the eight. Part E, to investigate how quickly hot water cools, the apparatus below, or shown below, was used. In each beaker, uh, and they're identical beaker, contains the same volume of water. The initial temperature of the water in one beaker was 100 degrees C and in the other beaker the initial temperature was 50 degrees C. The temperature of the water in each beaker was recorded at one minute intervals for five minutes. The graphs show the results of the investigation. So we've got one starting from 100, one starting from 50, <coughs> Uh, 
Okay, which baker has cooled more quickly in the five minutes? And support your answer with two appropriate calculations. So obviously you're looking at the temperature difference between the start and the end. So one of them drops from 100 down to 55, and the other one drops from 50 down to 20. So when it says support your answer with appropriate calculations, this is, is you're subtracting the start temperature or the end temperature from the start temperature in both cases. So these are the calculations, 100 minus 55 giving you 45 and 50 minus 20 giving you 30 degrees. And so we can tell that the biggest drop was in beaker A because it's the one. And again, our graph doesn't show that, but it's the one that starts at 100. And B is the one that starts at 50 because that's what the diagram says. A starts at 100, B starts at 50. So it's clearly bigger A that's cooling the quickest, and that's the calculation that we show. So we pick A because A had uh, 100 going down to 55, which means it's 50 to 45 degrees cooler, and B went from 50 to 20, which means it's 30 degrees cooler. Question 5. A. Radiocarbon dating is a method for determining the age of a wooden object all wood contains an isotope of carbon which is radioactive. Complete the decay equation for this isotope of carbon and write the appropriate numbers and symbol in the boxes provided. Okay, so we've got carbon-14 going to nitrogen-14. And the important thing here is that the nucleon number doesn't change. And so that means it must be a beta decay. When the nucleon number doesn't change, uh, what you've got is a proton and neutron exchanging places with each other you know one one becomes the other a neutron becomes a proton uh, plus an electron and the electron is fired out as a beta particle so this is beta decay so we can write in the big box that this is either an e for an electron or a beta for a beta particle i like to write beta particle uh, the beta particle is an electron so it's it's not a nucleon, so its nucleon number is not. It's not, so it's not. And uh, it's sort of like the opposite of a proton. Uh, the proton you can imagine as being uh, a plus one in the other number. This is like a minus one in the other number. Part two, a piece of wood from an ancient spear. Actually, just before I go on, um, Remember that the numbers in these lines have to balance. So if you've got 14 going to 14, whatever here has to be a zero. You don't necessarily need to know the properties of a beta particle. You need to know that 14 has to equal 14 plus whatever's in here. And that means it has to be a zero. And that six has to equal seven added to whatever's in here. So that means this has to be a minus one. So you could know the properties of a beta particle or you could just follow the equation rules that 14 uh, plus nothing equals 14 and that 7 added to negative 1 equals 6. Okay, part 2 then. Uh, a piece of wood from an ancient spear has an activity of 4 disintegrations per minute recorded due to the decay of this isotope of carbon. A fresh piece of wood of the same mass has an activity of 32 disintegrations per minute. This is also due to the decay of the isotope of carbon. The half-life of this isotope of carbon is 5,730 years. Calculate the age of the wood from the ancient spear. <clears throat> so basically, we are going from a value of 32 for fresh wood down to 4 for like old wood. And the idea here is that how many half-lives would it be to take us down from 32 down to 4? And so 
I find the easiest way is to draw this out as a set of halvings, okay? So we start at 32 and we have it once. So that'll get us to 16. And then we have it again and that'll get us to 8. And obviously if we have that, then we will get to 4. We'll get to our destination, which is the going from 32, which is what... down to 4, which is what we've ended up with. And you can see we've had to halve it three times. And so each one of these halvings is the basically one half-life elapsing. So one of these 5,730 years for here, another one of them for here, another one of them for here. So we have gone through three half-lives. So it's halved three times, so the time elapsed is three half-lives. So the total time is just three times the length of a half-life. So that's three times 5730. And that comes to 17190 years. So it's all about recognising that a half-life is the halving of the activity. So it halves, then it halves again, then it halves again, and it takes that many halvings to end up where we end up. And if it's a lower number, like two, we have to go again. Uh, or if it's one, we have to go again twice. So that's the idea of how Half-Life works. It's the time for it to fall to half of its previous activity. Part B. The range of alpha particles in air may be investigated using the equipment shown below. So you've got an alpha particle source and you've got some kind of detector. And the distance between the alpha source and the radiation is changed. Or the radiation detector, sorry, is changed. Uh, the reading on the count meter is noted in counts per second for each distance. A graph of the count rate against the distance was plotted and as shown below. Okay, so we want to look at that. Okay, so we've got a decent sized count rate, decent sized count rate, and it eventually comes away down to a very low value of count, which doesn't decrease anymore. Okay, so we can sort of make assumptions, a bit like that graph that we've shown previously with the cooling of the, the hot liquid. It, it'll settle off at like room temperature. Well, this is settling off at the uh, radiation that was present in the room. This is the sort of background radiation level, okay? So this is the actual alpha particle contributing to what you're getting. And eventually it's far enough away that you only get the background. That's what's going on in this graph. So what are they asking? Oh great, we have to go to a different page for that, right? Give me a second. What is the name given to this constant reading? Okay, well that's gonna be our background radiation. What is the source of this constant radiation? Uh, reading, sorry. Um, that's obviously gonna be what we describe for background radiation. So this is radiation that's present in our environment. So uh, we get radiation coming up from the ground from various rocks that are radioactive in the ground. We get radiation coming in from space in the form of cosmic rays and stuff like that. Using the graph then, estimate the range of alpha particles in air. Well, you can see here in the graph that basically we still have a signal. It eventually flattens off around about here. So somewhere around about just slightly over 2.5 centimetres there where it finally goes flat. Okay. Part C then, nuclear radiation can present danger to living organisms. Explain why nuclear radiation is dangerous to living cells and state what damage it can cause. Okay, so we need to know our basic notes about this, which is the idea that uh, nuclear radiation is what we call ionizing radiation. It has the ability to ionize. And the idea then is that that may disrupt uh, the DNA in cells. 
and that that may lead to cancer. So it's important that you don't go full on with this. Has the ability to ionize atoms, this may disrupt the DNA and that may in turn cause cancer. Part D then, nuclear fusion is a possible source of energy for the future, the nuclei of which three isotopes could be used as fuel in a fusion reactor. So your notes will have uh, the three isotopes of hydrogen listed here. So we've got hydrogen, uh, hydrogen 2 is called deuterium and hydrogen 3 is called tritium. Now I don't know if you get away with the symbols but you might do. We have an almost limitless supply of fusion fuel here on earth. Where can it be found? Well if you think about hydrogen, H2O, our oceans Name the element that is the major byproduct of nuclear fusion. Remember that what you get is hydrogen fusing to form helium. And that is my favourite bit. When this bit comes up at the end and it tells you that you are done. Okay folks, thanks very much for taking the time and hopefully this will be helpful to you in your preparations for your exams. Thanks for watching.